Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the first episode of the story in which Hiruzen takes charge and finds a way to fulfill Minato's dying wish. Much has changed in the Narutoverse since the clan heads and Danzo have joined forces to train Naruto. Naruto accepts his parents' and clan's final wish to bring peace to the elemental nations. Join our smarter and more OP blonde knucklehead on his unique path to peace. This story is from Bjdakuch. Please support him. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. As the longest, darkest night in Kanahagakor's history came to an end, a flash was seen as a massive, 50-meter-tall fox suddenly disappeared. Near the site of the disappearance, a blonde man in a shredded white haori can be seen lying next to a beautiful, motionless redhead. In his arms, a blonde baby boy with three whisker marks on each cheek was sleeping peacefully. As the barrier around the ritual site faded, Hiruzen Sarutobi, the third Hokage of Kanahagakurino Sato, approached the downed couple. Minato, what happened to the Kyubi? Are you okay, my boy? asked the previous Hokage. Hiruzen, I don't have much time left. This is my son, Naruto. I sealed the Kyubi in him with the Reaper Death Seal. Please, keep him safe. Raise him with love and help him carry his burdens. Oh, my boy. Why didn't you ask me to use that seal? The village still needs you, cried a dejected Hiruzen. Each member of the ANBU detail could be seen shaking with tears pouring out from below their masks. One silver-haired ANBU was on his knees, wailing openly and crying, Sensei, Sensei please don't go. Not you too Sensei. Kakashi, don't cry for me. I protected my village, and my son. He is going to need you Kakashi. Be strong for him, help him and when the time comes teach him. As I loved you as my own son, I ask you to love him. In between sobs, the now known Kakashi swore an oath to the heavens, I swear Sensei. I will do as you ask. Minato looked back to Hiruzen, Hiruzen, I am fading. Please old man, fight for my son. Protect him. A lot of hate will be aimed at him from inside and outside the village. He should be seen as a hero. Please, old man, protect him. Rely on my and Kushina's friends. I have faith in them. With the last of his willpower, Minato rolls back on his side and embraces Kushina. With a final kiss to her lips, Minato's soul is finally pulled into the stomach of the Shinigami. As the shock faded, Hiruzen stumbles over to the baby swaddled in Minato's arms and picks him up. Dog, Soru, please secure Lord Forth and Lady Kushina. Everything you saw here is an Srank secret that is not to be spoken of. Take them to the tower and secures their bodies. Later in the council room Hiruzen enters the council chamber still holding Naruto to see all his clan heads assembled on his left. Their clothes are dirty, singed and clearly displaying signs of the battle that just drew to a close. He nods his head to the clan heads as an incessant racket draws his attention to the other side of the room. On the right, the civilian council is present. It should be noted that they are all in their fine dress that is perfectly clean. After all, they were all escorted to their bunkers early in the battle. As soon as they notice the third Hokage, the noise starts to fade. To the rear of the Hokage chair, three older people can be seen. These are the village elders. Hamira Mitokado, Genin teammate of Hiruzen, is an old man with a long face, glasses, a grey chin wrap beard and wild grey hair. Koharu Yudatane, also a Genin teammate of Hiruzen, is an old woman with narrowed, downcast eyes and a permanent frown. Finally, is Danzo Shimura, longtime rival of Hiruzen. He has jet black hair and an shaped scar over his chin. However, his most defining feature is the bandages wrapped over half of his face, covering his right eye. He also has his right arm bandaged and in a sling. As Hiruzen takes in the panicked and distressed looks of his council, he knows he is in for a long night. As he takes his seat, he draws in a deep breath and says, All right, let's get this council meeting started. 
Immediately, cries ring out from the civilian side of the council. Each shout drowning out the next. As the noise escalates, a pineapple-haired clan head raises his head off the table and in a voice few have ever heard yells, Tubblesome. One at a time. This isn't the fucking school cafeteria. As the rest of the noise dies out, the newly appointed civilian representative, Mibuki Haruno, a pink-haired woman in her early to mid-twenties says, Lord Third, what happened to Minato Kuen? Hiruzen replies, Please, Mibuki, sit down. There is a lot I must cover with the council. Please hold all questions until I am done speaking. The civilian representative sits with a sour look on her face at being dismissed but listens in as Hiruzen recounts the events of the night to the council. As Hiruzen's story comes to a close, he broke the bad news. Minato Kun and Kushinachan are dead. They died defeating the Kyubi and they have left their son in the care of Jiraiya and Kakashi Hataki. At this, the clan heads all shifted, and their heads swiveled. Finally, Hayashi Hyuga speaks up, Lord Third, are you saying that boy there is Minato and Kushina's child? Yes, Hayashi. This is Naruto, the heir of the Namikaze and Uzumaki clans. The Hyuga head replies, Lord Third, Minato and Kushina were dear friends of the clan and Hitomi-chan. Naruto should be raised in a set household, not in the care of Lord Jiraiya and a teenage boy. This riled up the clan heads, many proclaiming their friendship to Minato and saying they would also like to raise the boy. After a minute, Hiruzen called for silence and said, Hayashi, I appreciate your friendship with Minato, but I cannot show favoritism to one clan. Young Naruto was bequeathed to Jiraiya in their will, and I bore witness to Minato asking Kakashi to help raise him during his final moments. Hayashi bowed his head and sat back down. This led to a pregnant pause which was once again broken by Mibuki Haruno, Lord Third, what happened to the Kyubi? After taking a deep breath, Hiruzen says, Minato sealed the Kyubi into young Naruto using the Reaper Death Seal. Before you start shouting to kill the demon, I would like to demonstrate something for the civilian side of the council. He pulls out a scroll and a kunai. He asks Mibuki in a patronizing tone, Mibuki, can you please tell me what I hold in each hand? She replies with, a scroll and a kunai, Lord Third. Precisely, he replies while sealing the kunai into the scroll. Now Mibuki, what do I hold in my hand? A scroll, Lord Third. A small smile flitters upon the wizened visage of Hiruzen. Ah, I am so happy you see it that way. I wanted to make this clear. Young Naruto is not the Kyubi. He is the prison into which the demon is sealed. If this young man is killed, the demon will be released and will once again imperil our village. A male civilian counselor stands up and shouts, No, Lord Third. That thing is a demon. It should be killed here and now so we can finally be rid of it. After that outrageous statement, Hiruzen made a motion with his hand and the dog-masked Umbu appeared behind the civilian counselor. With a swift stroke of his wakizashi, he removed the man's head and let it roll to the ground. The silence was broken as blood sloshed out from the man's neck and made a sickening, squelching sound. Two ANBU descended and picked up the remains. Hiruzen took this as his cue to issue a warning. My fellow counsel, listen up because I will not repeat this. This silence in between his sentences was deafening as the man radiated a killing aura that caught the attention of shinobi and civilians alike. Naruto is under my protection. I swore to Minato as his final wish that the boy would grow up safe in a village that will see him as the hero he is. As his eyes swept the room, many of the civilian council looked down, not meeting his eyes. The shinobi met his gaze proudly, with slight nods of their heads confirming that they were with their newly reinstated Hokage. Behind Hiruzen, Danzo made a slight shift and narrowing of his eyes. Let me close this meeting, it has been a long night and all of us have family and clans to check on. I will be relying on each of you to fill out damage reports, prioritize key infrastructure and needs. 
We will need to work together to rebuild our beloved village and protect it. Fugaku and Hayashi, please stay. As the council room emptied, Fugaku and Hayashi stood to attention and saluted. Hiruzen returned the salute and motioned them to sit. Fugaku, with over a third of the western village destroyed and the wall collapsed I will need the police now more than ever. I also ask you, Hayashi, to provide support to the Uchiha until our defenses have re-stabilized. Fugaku begins to reply with, Lord Third, the Uchiha can. Enough Fugaku. Your rivalry be damned. Every man and woman that can help rebuild and protect the village is needed now. I ask you to work with Hayashi to make sure our village is secured. Yes, Lord Third. Says Fugaku with his head bowed. It will be done. States Hayashi with his typical, unreadable impression. Thank you. Now I know both of you will want to help with young Naruto-kun. I will invite you to a meeting to discuss his future once this madness has settled. In the meantime, he will stay at the Sarutobi compound. As the two leave the room, Hiruzen sighs and takes out his pipe from his robes. He lights it up and takes a deep drag as he looks down on the infant in the makeshift cradle, I promise, Minato and Kushina. Your sacrifice will not be in vain. Two weeks later in the Hokage office Hiruzen sits down in his leather chair behind the Hokage desk with Naruto laying in a cradle beside his desk. His visage peeks through stacks of paperwork as he looks out over those in attendance. The three elders were seated on the right side of the room with Hayashi and Fugaku seated on the couch in front of his desk. One the back wall, a massive, middle-aged man with long, spiky white hair and a hishiate with the kanji 4 oil inscribed on it. He is wearing a red overshirt with a gray undershirt, metal arm bracers and gray pants finished with wooden geta sandals. This is one of the legendary Sanin, Lord Jiraiya of Mount Muboku. To his right is a beautiful woman who appears to be in her mid-twenties that has beautiful honey eyes with a purple diamond in the middle of her forehead. The green overcoat opens to reveal a white shirt that provides just enough cleavage to make all men struggle to keep their eyes up. She is leaning against the wall with an impassive expression on her face and her arms crossed across her ample chest. After summarizing the events of October 10th for the Sanin and getting a report from Fugaku on village security and the progress of the wall rebuilding, Hiruzen addresses the room. Thank you for your help over these past two weeks. Much has been done and there is much to do. Tsunade and Jiraiya, thank you for returning to the village on such short notice. I wish it were on better terms. Jiraiya gets a goofy grin on his face and says, Sure thing, Sensei. After that, his face turns serious and he says, Now, can we talk about my student's child, please? Yes, Jiraiya, I was getting to that. Minato and Kushina left young Naruto to your primary custody, Jiraiya. He also asked Hitaki Kakashi to assist in raising the boy. Sensei, I know why Minato gave me that responsibility, but I cannot possibly accept. I have my re. I mean duties outside the village, not to mention my spy network. With Kanoha in this state, it is more important than ever that we stay ahead of the threats. Tsunade makes a tisk sound and snaps her head away from Jiraiya in disgust. The pain she feels just from being in this godforsaken village has her at her wit's end. Now she must put up with her perverted exteemate. Unbelievable. Danzo cuts in before anyone can respond, I agree with Jiraiya. We cannot recall him to the village at this time. His intel has been instrumental in preventing many threats to Kanoha. I ask that the we. I mean child be put in my care, where I can train it properly. All faces in the room hardened as Hiruzen steps in, Danzo, I know that the roots of the great tree need to be kept but if I hear you refer to young Naruto in that way again, I. Will be finding a new groundskeeper. He takes a drag on his pipe and exhales, this child is to be raised in the light, with the help of the people in this room. Hayashi and Fugaku made an almost imperceptible shift and looked on excitedly. He continues, My plan is to have Naruto raised on the Namikaze estate. 
I have already assigned Tsubaki Sarutobi, a wet nurse and caretaker of the Sarutobi clan, to raise Naruto in his family home. As you all know, his existence as of now is only known to the council and is in class secret along with his Jinchuriki status. After taking a deep breath and another drag, he continues, I plan on the child's formative years being hidden in the Namikaze estate. Once he is old enough, each person in this room will be able to take part in his development and training. Yes, before you ask, even you Danzo. He chuckles and finishes with, you have many good things to teach, old friend. When the time is right, I will let you teach young Naruto and help form him into the shinobi we all know he can be. After an admittedly stunned silence, Tsunade says, Sensei, I will stay until his first birthday. After that, I am out. The pain this village brings me is too great, but I owe Kushina at least that much. Kohara chimes in, Hiruzen, you know how I feel about that, child. I will not be around it any more than need be. I want no part of that boy, he is a ticking time bomb. Jiraiya leans forward off the wall as he lets loose a sizable amount killing intent, enough to make the elders struggle under the weight of it. I know Sensei made this clear for his part but let me enlighten you. Naruto is under my protection. Whether I am in the village or not. If anything happens to the child, I will hold each person in this room personally responsible. He lets off a bit on the KI and continues, I have inspected the Shikifuan seal, and I will say that it is the strongest and most intricate seal ever placed on any of the Jinchuriki. Not only will the seal lock the Kyubi into Naruto, but the seal will also convert the Kyubi's chakra bit by bit into Naruto's own chakra pool and reserves. If you don't believe me, ask Hayashi. Every eye in the room turned to the startled Hyuga. He activated his Dujitsu and scanned Naruto, it is as Jiraiya says. Around the seal, I see small fragments of red chakra circling through the seal and turning into the natural blue chakra that we all have. Naruto's chakra does have a deeper blue look to it, but I think that is because of its potency. Another note, Naruto's own chakra reserves at two weeks old are already equal to most academy students. A gasp flittered through the room and a gleam appeared in Danzo's eyes. This could be the greatest weapon in the entire elemental nations. I need to have this child, but Hiruzen would never allow it. I cannot believe the fire that has returned to his eyes. If I cross him, I will not survive the fallout. For now, I will try to get access to the child. So I may observe firsthand, thought Danzo. Danzo looks at the Hokage and asks, Hokagesima, what is the plan for the child? Surely, he will need to become a ninja to learn to control the Kyubi. If he doesn't learn control, the beast could take advantage of that and escape. Hiruzen looks at Danzo then at each of the others around the room, I plan on Tsubaki raising Naruto in secrecy until he is ready to become a shinobi. I will give each person in this room access to the Namikaze's compound so that you may each visit Naruto. I would hope that with the right guidance, we can instill the will of fire into young Naruto and secure Minato's legacy and the future of our village. Tsunade chimes in, Sensei, Kushina would have wanted Naruto to have a normal childhood with friends, unburdened by the darkness of Shinobi. I know, Tsunade, but no matter how you look at it, Naruto is not normal. Furthermore, if his existence is made known, then we will have assassins from Kyumo and IWA looking to finish off Minato's legacy. Those grudges run deep. If we can keep him safe on the Namikaze estate until young Naruto starts at the academy, then we will have a much better chance of keeping Kyumo and IWA off his trail. At this point, Hayashi steps in, Lord Third, what if the child is raised under the name Uzumaki and then when the time is right, and the child is strong enough, we can announce his heritage. This would allow us to bring Naruto into the public and possibly create friendships with the other clan children. He will be watched and protected by the shinobi families while creating bonds that tie him to the village. That is an interesting idea. Kushina had her fair share of enemies as well though and the Uzumaki name may still attract the attention of Kyumo. 
Jiraiya decides to put in his two cents. Sensei, I will be able to stay ahead of any of that. We can provide a better life to Naruto, furthermore, if we play the Uzumaki name off as a common orphan's name then that would allow Naruto to be raised normally. We would of course tell him about his heritage, along with the trusted few clan heads who are loyal to Minato. This would keep his self-identity intact and protect him as much as possible. That is an interesting idea, Jiraiya. If the Uzumaki name reaches Kyumo, I expect you to do some counterintelligence work and make sure they believe the orphan story. I believe that is all for this meeting. Please return to your duties and aid with the village recovery. Three and a half years later three years passed in a flash for Naruto, Tsubaki and surprisingly, Tsunade. The vibrant ball of energy had brought so much light to every person he met. Tsubaki and Tsunade had started teaching Naruto to read after he complained that he couldn't understand of his, Tuchan's, books a year ago. Naruto struggled to learn, but what Twondahelfi rolled wouldn't. Now, Naruto is often seen carrying around a wooden kunai and reading books like, Intro to Fuinjutsu by Uzumaki Mito, and The Coolest Battles of Shinobi History by Rimuru Satoru. For his third birthday, Jiraiya had given Naruto the tale of the gutsy ninja, which inspired Naruto to profess himself a ninja and ask for a kunai. The next time Jiraiya showed up, he gave Naruto a box of wooden kunai. Aside from his reading, Naruto loved spending time outside on the training grounds of the Namikaze estate with his bakon, Tsunade. After the first year, Tsunade had decided that she would give life in Kanoha one more chance. Her attachment to the hyperactive toddler only grew and earned smiles, laughs and guffaws from all those that witnessed the unique relationship. Jiraiya and Hiruzen were ecstatic to see the light return to Tsunade's honeysuckle eyes and a smile to return to her face. The time she spent with her brat was filled with laughter, Naruto playing shinobi and Aunt Shizun trying to keep Tsunade from throwing Naruto over the Hokage mountain. After a year or so, Tsunade decided to return to Kanoha Hospital when she wasn't spending time with her last living relative. She was appalled to find out how much the standard of care had fallen. She then got the third Hokage to approve remedial training for all certified nurses and doctors at the hospital. She led the physical and medical retraining and became feared for her quick temper whenever she saw a negligent mistake. One day, she brought Naruto to a training session and introduced him as Naruto Uzumaki. The little blondie was running around in between groups of medics who were practicing their Aryan Ninjutsu. He would fake his own injury and yell for the medics. Somehow, he found the fake blood packs and was covered in the fake blood. The medics fell in love with the little blonde ball of sunshine and started treating his wounds. Tsunade walked up to a group of female medics and doctors cooing over what looked like a mummified bundle of bandages. The only indicator that it was Naruto was the blonde hair that was peeking out over the tops of the bandages. The mummy training incident incited the hospital staff to nominate Naruto as their mascot. This, in turn, was how Naruto fell in love with training. He started showing up regularly for the morning workouts. Shizun, now officially confirmed as Tsunade's apprentice, would walk him through basic physical exercises. His endless energy basically guaranteed that Shizun was the one that left training tired. Once Shizun was tired out, Naruto encouraged the other medical personnel to help them finish their workouts. This was the brilliant start to Naruto's public persona. Today, Naruto was extra excited because he was invited to a birthday party for the first time. Despite Naruto getting to meet Jiraiya, Tsunade, Hokage Gigi, the weird old mummy guy, Hayashi, and Fugaku, he has yet to meet and play with anyone his age. That is why today was an ultra special, super important occasion to Naruto and he was pestering Tsubaki and Tsunade to make sure everything was perfect. Okay, back on. I have these nice clothes, a present and I think I know what to say to Hayashi-sama when I get there. Am I forgetting anything? What do you say to Hayashi-sama when he greets you? asked Tsunade with a coy smile and light in her eyes. Good afternoon Hyuga-sama, I am grateful for your invitation, 
replied a self-assured Naruto. Good, and then what do you do with the gift? I give them gift to Hayashi-sama and say that this is a gift to celebrate Hinata-san's third birthday, answered a slightly less confident knucklehead. That will do. Just have fun Naruto and make some friends your age. All right, let's get going, said Tsunade as she shuffled the youngster out of the house and compound. Walking through the village, many of the villagers would point at Tsunade and ask things like, is that Tsunade-sama's child? This made Tsunade remember her little brother Nawaki, whom Naruto reminded her so much of. Naruto looked up and noticed Tsunade's slight frown and asked her, what's wrong back on? Tsunade shook off her thoughts and Naruto's question and simply answered him with a smile and ruffle of the hair. After all the looks, greetings and whispers Tsunade was glad to arrive at the Hyuga compound. The two gate guards noticed Tsunade walking up and rushed off to get Hayashi. As they walked through the gate, they saw Hayashi and Hitomi waiting for them. Hitomi was a beautiful woman with dark blue-black hair and pale white eyes that had a lavender tint to them. She was teammates with Kushina and as soon as Hayashi had told her about Naruto she had been waiting to meet her friend's hidden son. She smiled as she saw the young blonde approach. Naruto walked up with a laughably rigged posture and said, Good afternoon, Hyuga-sama. I brought a gift for Hinata-chan's birthday. Data Bayo. Hayashi cocked an eyebrow at the youngster. Which for a Hyuga was the equivalent to a hearty laugh and smack on the back by an Akimichi. The vibrant nature of his greeting stood in stark contrast to the typical Hyuga etiquette. After Hayashi composed himself, he returned the greeting by bowing his head slightly to Tsunade. Good evening, Tsunade-sama and Uzumaki-san. I am grateful you could join us to commemorate Hinata's third birthday. Truth be told, Hayashi wasn't one to throw a party for such a paltry reason, but Hitomi had been bothering him about getting to meet Naruto and this was as good an excuse as any. I apologize but I have to head to the Hokage Tower. The delegate from Kyumo will be wrapping up with the signing of the treaty and we have agreed to house him as a show of good faith. Tsunade waved him off and said, I am surprised you would let him stay here. Have a safe trip and we can share some sake when you get back. As Hayashi walked out of the compound with his brother and personal guard, Hitomi ushered the duo into the compound's courtyard where laughing and talking could be heard from the front. Gate Naruto noticed how big and fancy the Hyuga compound was compared to his parents' house. It was modeled after an old Japanese architecture that was simple, yet elegant. As he approached the courtyard with Tsunade just a step behind him, Naruto spotted the birthday girl. She was a small little thing with dark blue hair cut in a heim style, mousy face and a small build. She was wearing a formal lavender kimono that made her look like a proper little noble toddler. Naruto walked up to her and kicked off the conversation with a gigawatt smile. Good evening Hinata-san. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. Thanks for inviting me to your birthday party. I brought a present for you. The girl was stunned by his outgoing behavior and immediately blushed, looked down to the ground and kept touching her index fingers together. After a moment, she looked up slightly and replied with, Thank you for coming to celebrate my birthday. It is nice to meet you Uzumaki-san. My name is Hyuga Hinata. Please put your present over there with the others. She pointed to a pile of presents and smiled shyly. She was then pulled away from the conversation by another Hyuga that looked slightly older than her and had a much more rigid posture and face. After Tsunade took Naruto to get some food, they sat down at a table with a man with two diagonal scars on the right side of his face that had his hair done up in a spiky ponytail. He was sitting next to a similar and smaller version of himself. They both had an extremely lackadaisical posture that seemed to say, please don't be too troublesome. As Naruto sat down, the older of the two perked up and met eyes with Tsunade. Their silent conversation confirmed that this was Minato's son, whom Shikaku had been waiting eagerly to meet. He was the fourth Hokage's jonin commander and was very close to Minato and Kushina. In fact, he was one of the only people that knew when and where they were going to have the baby. 
the events of that night had plagued his nightmares. There was just a piece of that puzzle that Shikaku couldn't figure out. They had taken so many precautions, how did it all go wrong? Shikaku was pulled from his reflections by the loud and proud greeting of Naruto. Shikaku put on a smile and answered the vibrant blonde with, Good evening, Naruto, my name is Shikaku Nara, and this is my son Shikamaru. Shikamaru had noticed his dad perk up and the immediate drift of his father's train of thought. He looked to his dad and then offered his hand to Naruto. The two sat next to each other and talked while Naruto ate. Let it be known that all Tsubaki's attempts to teach Naruto table manners had not yet taken effect. After Naruto finished eating, he and Shikamaru went off to play with a group of kids. As the evening progressed, Naruto had met a bunch of the clan head's children, not that he knew they were clan heirs. His vibrant nature and boisterous personality rapidly got him nominated as the leader of the groups. Games They played ninja, tag, hide-and-seek and even a ninja game that involved the kids trying to throw wooden kunai through holes of different sizes. During these games, he met Ino Yamanaka, Chuji Akimichi, and a feral-looking boy named Kiba. Eventually, Hinata and Niji had come and joined the group to play. The adults had been looking on with smiles on their faces. Tsunade, with sake in hand, wore a proud smile and a wistful look in her eyes. A group of three males stood casually next to each other while watching the children play. In this group was Shikaku and his friends Chuza Akimichi and Inoichi Yamanaka. Chuza is a big, burly man with long red and spiky hair. He towered over his two friends as he wore a formal black kimono with the Akimichi clan crest emblazoned over his heart and on his back. Inoichi Yamanaka is a slender man with a narrow face, emerald eyes and sandy blonde hair. He had a faraway look in his eyes as he watched the children. Inoichi broke the comfortable silence with, he is a natural leader, just like Minato. Chuza chuckled and drank some of his beer, indeed he is. He is the spitting image of Minato. Although I see a bit of Kushina in him. Especially in that wild personality of his. Shikaku chimed in with, maybe more than a little bit of her personality. I think it may get to be a bit troublesome. The group turned as they heard a full-blown feminine laugh from behind them. They turned and greeted Tsunade who simply nodded and said, you have no idea. They continued a friendly conversation while watching the children's antics. As the evening drew to a close, Hitomi had invited Naruto to stay the night. She said that Naruto could stay in Hinata's room. Niji would be there as well so nothing untoward would happen. Come on, who could ever think about two three-year-olds doing anything of that nature? Formalities be damned, she couldn't get enough of Naruto and the effect he was having on Hinata. After Hinata's initial wave of anxiety, the blonde had done more to get her out of her shell in four hours than the whole Hyuga clan had done in three years. A drunken Tsunade had accepted her offer and headed back to the Namike's estate to let Tsubaki know. They had bathed the kids and placed them in Hinata's room with some extra futons. The kids had fallen asleep almost immediately. As the whole estate went to sleep, aside from the patrols, Naruto's dreams began taking an ominous turn. He started to roll and shift around on his mat until he woke up and went to look for some water. As he was returning from the bathroom, he noticed that Hinata's door was open. He couldn't shake the ominous feeling from earlier, so he was on guard. He reached in his pocket and pulled out his wooden kunai and creeped to the door. When he entered, he saw a man in all black tying up Hinata and Niji slumped against the wall, bleeding from his head. After a moment's panic, Naruto screamed as loud as he could, Get away from Hinata-chan! As he screamed, his eyes flickered red and he jumped at the startled intruder. The man would regret not taking him seriously as a wooden kunai ended up lodged in his eye. The man then grabbed Naruto and said, Die brat! Damn you! He chucked Naruto through two walls into the Hyuga's courtyard where he slammed into the fountain and passed out with blood coming from his head. The man then grabbed Hinata and began to run but was surrounded by a group of Hyuga guards and Hayashi. 
Hayashi scowled and stated in an ice-cold tone, you will put my daughter down and come with us or your life is forfeit. As he finished saying this, Hitomi slid through the group of guards with a speed and grace of water and then began to strike the man rapidly from his blind spot. Eight trigrams protection of the sixty-four palms, she intoned with an icy chill as the man began to crumple to the ground. The girl he was carrying over his left shoulder had stopped him from reacting in time. As he fell, he dropped the struggling Hinata. He lay face down in the dirt, in too much pain for him to use the suicide syringe he had brought for this exact reason. He began struggling with his tongue to get to the cyanide capsule he had lodged in one of his teeth. Hayashi, with his Byakugan activated saw this, dashed to the man and flipped him over. He paralyzed the man's jaw, forced his mouth open and removed the capsule. He pointed to two of his guards and told them to take this man to T and I. He pointed to his brother, Hizashi, and another branch member and had them go tell the Hokage. It was at this point that Hitomi processed Naruto's crumpled form on the fountain. She cried out in fear as she sprinted over to Naruto's body. The scream also drew Hayashi's attention, and he sent another Hyuga to go and inform Tsunade that they will be taking Naruto to the hospital. Hayashi gently pushed aside his wife and daughter that were kneeling over an unconscious Naruto and scooped him up. His heart was overflowing with gratitude and apprehension as he raced across the rooftops with an unconscious Naruto. Aftermath of Hyuga incident Naruto woke up with a massive headache feeling like his whole body was aching. He tried moving his left arm but was unable to. Something big, soft and attached to something heavier was stopping him from moving. As he opened his eyes and cleared his blurry vision, he saw his back on was slumped over the bed with his arms secured between her two voluminous mounds. He looked over and saw the flowers and, get well, cards from the Hyugas and medical staff. The sun was beginning to light up the village and peek through the curtains. He noticed that Tsunade was beginning to stir thanks to his movement and the beam of sunlight that found its way into her eyes. As she came to, she cleared the saliva from her chin and began to cry as her eyes met Naruto's. Naruto freed his arm and patted her head, it's okay, Bakon. I'm okay. She cleared her tears and her honeysuckle eyes shimmered as the light bounced off the wet orbs, you scared me, brat. You were out for a whole day. After a bit, Naruto asked about Hinata. Tsunade smiled and said, she is fine, little hero. You saved her. Naruto's gigawatt smile lit up the room and he let out a deep breath. A nurse popped into the room and saw this. She waved over the rest of the nurses on the floor. Tsunade turned around and noticed six nurses peeking through the door at the heartwarming scene. What are you looking at? Get to it. Tsunade playfully yelled as the nurse began her checkup and the rest of them scattered. After scanning Naruto with a diagnostic jutsu, the nurse couldn't believe it. Yesterday, Naruto had three broken ribs, a broken arm, a cracked vertebrae and a concussion. Now, aside from some residual injuries, the kid was fine. She asked Tsunade to check her work, just to make sure she didn't do it wrong. Tsunade confirmed her findings and told the nurse that the kid may have a healing factor and that she would conduct the tests herself. It was at this point the third Hokage entered, and Naruto's confusion turned into another brilliant smile. Good morning, Hokage Gigi. I am all better now. Hiruzen turned to Tsunade for confirmation and got a slight nod in response and a look in her eyes that said, we will talk about it later. He then turned back to Naruto and asked, good morning, Naruto-kun. You gave us quite a scare. Are you sure you are feeling all right? Hi, Gigi. I am totally fine, especially since Hinata-chan is okay. What happened to that bad guy? Hiruzen chuckled at the boy's exuberance, yes, Naruto-kun, Hinata-chan is fine. The bad guy was arrested, and we are, talking to him now. Don't you worry about that, just get better. Hi, Gigi. I want to get stronger Gigi, that man hurt me, and he would have hurt Hinatakan. Please, Gigi. 
Train me, please. Hiruzen's smile fell, and he said, You are still young, Naruto-kun. Why don't you enjoy being a kid for now? No, Gigi. I want to get strong so I can protect my friends and take that hat from you. Please, Gigi. Just a little bit of training, I really want to be able to protect my friends. Besides, I can train and have friends and spend time with you and back on. Please, Gigi. The smile returned to Hiruzen's face, and he said, Okay, Naruto-kun. Just a little bit of training. However, I still want you to be a kid and spend time with your friends. Hi, Gigi. I promise, replied an ecstatic Naruto. Later that day in the Hokage's office, Hiruzen was talking with Hayashi, Hizashi, Hitomi, his advisors, and Tsunade. It turns out that the man was the head ninja of Kyumo, the same man that was the ambassador for the peace treaty that was just signed. He had been tasked with kidnapping an unsealed Byakugan and returning with it to Kyumo. If he were caught, he was to immediately commit suicide so that his death could be blamed on Kanoha. However, the quick actions of Hitomi and Hayashi stopped him from being able to end his life. Now, he was interrogated via the mind-walking of the Yamanaka clan while he was kept asleep by a sleep seal that Jiraiya made for suicide risk T and I prisoners. Danzo opened the conversation, Hiruzen, this cannot be allowed to stand. This is a violation of the treaty we just signed. It is clear that the treaty was just a manipulation by the third rakage to trap us. Their own ambassador is the one tasked with kidnapping the Hyuga girl for Kami's sake. We should take this as an act of war. Hiruzen frowned, he knew he would get this reaction from his old rival. Relax, Danzo. It is not that I disagree with you, but we have just recovered from the Kyuubi's attack. We cannot afford to go to war at this time. Kohara nodded and said, war would not be beneficial. We are simply not in the right state to commit to a war with Kyumo. However, we have a valuable political card here, Hokage-sama. We cannot afford to fold this hand either. Danzo cut back in, is it true that the boy managed to wound the enemy shinobi with a wooden kunai? Yes, Danzo. Naruto was able to catch the kidnapper by surprise and lodged his wooden kunai in the man's left eye as he was tying up Hinata, replied an amused Hiruzen. Danzo nodded his head and simply said, impressive, for one so young. As the room agreed with Danzo's statement, Hitomi spoke up, Hokage-sama, if I may speak freely? Hiruzen nodded and Hitomi squeezed Hayashi's hand as she continued, the Hyuga and the Uzumaki are the clans affected. They attempted to kidnap our heir and, in the process, they harmed the sole heir of two clans. Murmurs of confirmation came from everybody, and Tsunade's face adopted a look of cold fury. However, it would seem that revenge may be out of our reach. So how about the next best thing, she asked looks of confusion erupted from everyone. Then Hitomi saw a twinkle in the Hokage's eye, yes, Hokage-sama. How about public humiliation? That is what that proud bastard of a rakage would hate the most. Hiruzen chuckled and he took a hit of his pipe, ah, Hitomakan. Remind me to never get on your bad side. What does everyone think? I think we could talk to Daimyo-sama and get his help on this. Hi, Hokage-sama. They chorused. There was a slight frown on Danzo's face but that lifted when he heard the next bit of news. Young Naruto woke up today and asked me for a favor that I am a bit hesitant to grant. He asked me to be trained in the shinobi art so that he could get strong enough to protect his friends. Hiruzen said a bit resignedly. Danzo replied immediately, Hokage-sama, I volunteer to train the boy. You know that I have plenty of experience training shinobi from a younger age. I believe that I can get him trained. I have no doubt that you can, old friend. However, I do not want any of that emotional conditioning nonsense. Hayashi cut in at this point, Hokage-sama, the Hyuga clan Ouzumaki Sanadet. I believe that training is the least we could do to repay him. 
Tsunade then broke into the conversation, I want a piece of him too. That kid has enormous potential, and he is already joining the medical staff for their morning training. Hell, the brat can keep up with most of my doctors. Hiruzen outright laughed at the immediate explosion of interest in his successor's son, okay, okay. They say it takes a village to raise a child. The way I see it, young Naruto claimed his right to be my successor. I see that potential in him. However, I don't want to rob young Naruto of his childhood. We can create a schedule so that each of you can begin training him. Danzo, I am serious. None of your old root training and emotional programming. I will be keeping my eyes on the child's progress. I want you to teach him, in an appropriate manner, about the darkness of the shinobi world. We will handle showing him the leaf that bathes in the sun, and you have my permission to give him a glimpse of the roots of the great tree. Tsunade was bothered by this. She couldn't deny Danzo's effectiveness, but his methods were known to be brutal and damaging. Sensei, I know Danzo has a lot to teach. I would be lying if I said I weren't concerned about his methods, however, I will be watching him closely. My stipulation is that all training is to be done in the Namike's training grounds. This will keep Naruto protected from prying eyes that would wonder why one boy is getting so much attention. Agreed, said Hiruzen as he once again saw consensus around the room. We will come up with a suitable schedule. I trust that Tsubaki has begun instruction of basic knowledge already. So, each of you will get one day a week to train Naruto. Since this is a group effort, what you teach will be known to the others. I will conduct annual progress reports with the boy. Anything else that need be discussed? With that the meeting came to a close and Hiruzen sent a letter to the fire daimyo. Kumo's bad day A, the third rakage of Kumo, was a proud man. His pride was the only thing that could eclipse his strength. So, when he was visited unannounced by the lightning daimyo, who came with a party of one hundred samurai and one prisoner, he was in a rather foul mood. The mood soured further when he caught a look at the prisoner's face from his city's gates. The vein that immediately popped on the man's head was so pronounced that you could see his heartbeat through its pulsing. Behind him, his son and named successor, also named A.I., could be seen. He picked up on his father's foul mood and took a step back and stood in silence. When one's father was on the Biju subjugation squad and had fought the Eight Tails one-on-one -on -one and had subdued it with only a wound to his chest, one knows not to be around when said father is angry. Killer B, the third rakage adoptive son and vessel of the Eight-Tailed Octopus, also backed up and gave his adoptive father room. As the lightning daimyo's entourage approached, they noticed the serious look of the entourage. The samurai took a ready stance when they saw the black lightning dancing off the third rakage. The lightning daimyo had his men stand down since he was familiar with the antics of A. The daimyo motioned with his hand and the prisoner was brought forward. The previous head ninja of A's shinobi force wore a downcast look and sported an eye patch. He bowed his head, spoke out of turn and said, I. I am sorry, rakage sama it was at that point that the black lightning exploded from A's body, he bounded forward and severed the man's head from his body. As the body fell lifelessly to the ground, the daimyo looked aghast at the behavior in the presence of a daimyo. The blood that spouted from the headless man splashed near the daimyo's feet. The lightning daimyo said, Well, A, I had come to discuss the diplomatic ramifications of you creating a treaty, signing it and violating it on the same night it was signed. Now, though, that seems unnecessary. I, hereby, decree that any and all financial assistance from the Land of Lightning, as well as mission requests and funding, are suspended until the third rakage, A, has been removed from office and replaced. I also expect a formal and public apology to Kanoha to be made for violating the Five Nations' rules of neutrality. I will await the newly appointed Kage in the capital. That is all. The lightning daimyo ascended back into his carriage and the whole entourage turned back to the lightning capital. 
A deafening and palpable silence hung over the crowd as the lightning daimyo departed. The third rakage looked frozen, as if he had locked up. His faces started turning blue and a slight twitching could be seen from his body. In his rage, his lightning chakra had gone out of control and caused his heart to start beating arrhythmically. If anyone dared to approach him, they may have noticed. Instead, they all waited for the third rakage to explode. Then they kept waiting, nobody wanting to make the first move and draw upon the wrath of A. However, after nearly thirty minutes, A's son approached and put an arm on his dad's shoulder. Dad, we will work this. He never got to finish his sentence because the slight pressure from A.I.'s massive fist was the only force needed to push his now dead father over. Everyone gasped as the third rakage fell, face first, dead on the paved road leading into Kumo. The carnage that followed left the land of lightning in a state of upheaval for the next three months. Eventually, A.I., the son of the third rakage, was named the fourth rakage of Kumo. The three months without missions and support from the Land of Lightning had caused a depression that would affect Kumo for nearly the next decade. A.I. handled the public apology to Kanoha as his first act as Rakage. A.I. made it his mission to restore Kumo to its former glory. He had the largest shinobi force in the elemental nations. Now all he had to do was restore the faith that his father lost. It was because of all this that A.I adopted a mentality that all international dealings will be on the up and up. At least as up and up as shinobi affairs can be. Once news hit Kanoha of Kumo's reaction to their humiliation, Sarutobi took all his advisors, the Hyuga clan representatives, Tsunade and Jiraiya out for a night of drinking that cost him nearly half a year of his salary. Sarutobi, while happy and very, very hungover, vowed to never again offer Jiraiya and Tsunade an all-expense-paid drinking night. As Sarutobi was waking up, Tsunade was also coming to her senses. She had long since moved into the Namike's estate, the Senju estate was so empty and brought up so many painful memories. That is why, when Tsunade woke up in her bed in the Namike's estate looking at a long mane of white hair covering a naked man that was snoring with his face down in the pillow, Tsunade then grabbed Jiraiya and chucked him out the window of her room. The racket she made and the hell she raised woke up the whole estate. Tsubaki and Naruto walked up on a ranting Tsunade. Her tirade continued until Naruto spoke up and calmed her down. Maybe it was the cute and innocent toddler, or maybe it was her completely nude state, but she eventually did calm down. Start of training a four-year-old Naruto woke up at the crack of dawn to get to his training. For the past six months, he had trained four days a week. On Mondays he trained with Tsunade and sometimes Shizun. On these days, he would join the hospital staff for their morning physical training. After physical training, Tsunade would make breakfast for Naruto while quizzing him on the previous week's homework. They covered subjects like chakra, chakra nature, chakra control, the basics of field medicine and human anatomy. While it could be said that Naruto was smart for his age, most of this material was quite hard for him to understand. He learned basic anatomy quick enough, and he knew how to treat cuts and basic wounds, but anything about physiology or internal medicine would clearly have to wait until Naruto was older. It was during this training that Naruto learned how to awaken and use his chakra. If Tsunade Bakon wasn't so scary, Naruto would admit that this was his least favorite day. Sure, Naruto understood that chakra control was super important. However, when a four-year-old has jonin-level chakra, it gets very frustrating for a four-year-old to control that much chakra. The leaf-sticking exercise was very hard for Naruto. It took him a whole month to be able to stick the leaf for 30 minutes. Damn leaves kept blowing off his head or lighting on fire when he was just trying to keep them stuck to his head. In between his weekly lessons, Naruto had stripped most of the trees near the Namikaze estate of their leaves. He would be out there on the training fields, day after day just trying to make the damn things stick. Tsunade recognized that Naruto's frustration just made the exercise harder. When she saw this, she would make him do physical exercises. 
Naruto did sets of 50 push-ups, diamond push-ups, pull-ups, squats, lunges, sit-ups and burpees and then he would run around the training grounds 10 times. By the end of 6 months, Naruto could repeat these sets easily. He remembered trying to learn the tree walking exercise. He got frustrated so often that he ended up doing 12 sets of his usual workout in one day. Tsunade was so surprised when she saw his physical prowess that she started made him meditate in between sets and tree walking attempts. To her immense pride, Naruto learned tree walking in three weeks. This control helped Naruto and after tree walking, Tsunade attempted to teach Naruto his first jutsu, the Henjino Jutsu. At the six-month mark of his weekly training, Naruto was close to mastering this technique. Naruto felt his progress and that filled him with pride. It also helped that whenever Naruto hit his training goals or mastered a new technique Tsunade would take him to Ichiraka Ramen. After mastering the leaf-sticking exercise, Tsunade took him to Ichiraku's. And like a crack addict, Naruto was hooked after the first bowl. The repeat visits led to Naruto eating three extra-large bowls of ramen at the ripe young age of four. Tuchi, the stand's owner, saw the next coming of Kushina and his future best customer. Tuchi and Ayam were quickly added to Naruto's list of those he would train to protect. Tuesdays were days that the Hyuga clan opted to teach Naruto. Hayashi, Hizashi, and Hitomi split this duty. Their goal was to teach Naruto the basics of taijutsu to establish a base for his taijutsu. They also focused on the importance of being precise during katas, which taught Naruto attention to detail and precision. Hayashi was strict and emotionless, but it was clear that he took pride in his training. Days with Hayashi started with footing, form, and katas. They evolved into attacking the wooden training dummy and hand positioning. This was hard work, especially when Hayashi found out about Naruto's usual workout. After that, Hayashi would make Naruto do 50 repetitions of one of his exercises for each mistake he made in his katas. This produced results in Naruto's taijutsu basics. On the days Hizashi taught, Naruto often got to spar with Niji. This served to motivate both, and a friendly rivalry was formed. Under Hizashi's strict tutelage, both boys dared not step out of line. They were evenly matched, despite Niji being nearly a year older. However, toward the end of the six-month period, Hizashi had to admit that Naruto was pulling ahead in raw taijutsu. If Niji used the actual juken, then Naruto would be defeated but Hizashi did not want to start that type of sparring yet. Days with Hitomi were Naruto's favorite. Hitomi was kind, pretty and patient. She taught Naruto things like manners, etiquette and proper conduct. She knew this boy was going to grow into an important figure and didn't want him to be an ignoramus when it came to dealing with important people. The going was hard, but she could see the improvement. She also tried to bring Hinata whenever it was her turn to come. Naruto liked Hinata, she was nice, and she listened to him talk about whatever. After the first couple of visits, Hinata started getting more comfortable with Naruto. She would talk with much less stuttering, she stopped flushing whenever he looked at her and she was even able to yell at Naruto once when he made a distasteful joke about her mother. Naruto was so caught off guard by a yelling Hinata that he immediately apologized profusely. The two kids had a good friendship, but Naruto made it his mission to break Hinata out of her shell. Wednesdays were weird for Naruto. The old mummy came on Wednesdays. Naruto initially needed Tsubaki present when Danzo was teaching because Naruto feared the gruff, bandaged man. He was super strict, emotionless and talked about stuff that made Naruto feel awkward. Naruto hadn't seen a dead person yet, so whenever Danzo Sensei had talked about killing Naruto got wide-eyed and shy. The first three months Danzo kept the training topics lighter. Talking about the importance of stealth and operating without drawing attention. Surprisingly, Naruto proved an effective study at stealth lessons. The child had no concept of suppressing his chakra, which made him a beacon for a shinobi of Danzo's caliber. However, the boy was surprisingly good at staying out of sight. 
Danzo also piggybacked on the chakra control lesson Tsunade was teaching Naruto. He tried to get the boy to understand the importance. He was forbidden from teaching him water walking yet because his chakra coils were not developed enough. However, he would have the boy do exercises and katas while sticking to the tree. He did this to teach him control and multitasking. At four months in, Danzo started bringing his personal bodyguards with him to training. These people were pale sticks in the mud. They never smiled, never joked, never did anything. All they did was spar with Naruto and teach him. After watching Naruto do the leaf sticking exercise with one leaf on each of his arms, legs, torso, and forehead, Danzo noticed that the boy was starting to burn some leaves. This led him to test Naruto's chakra and find out that he had very high fire and wind affinities. Despite this amazing discovery, the training group concurred that it was too early to teach him any elemental jutsu. Even though the boy was a natural, all trainers felt like they should hold off, except Danzo. Finally came Thursday. This was Naruto's favorite day each week. This was Uchiha Day. Fugaku heard about the training of Naruto and knew that he had to take part in it. He focused on the boy's taijutsu, trap making, and shuriken jutsu. Things like physical activities seemed to motivate Naruto and he soaked up the knowledge like a sponge. Fugaku couldn't help but be proud of Naruto in Minato's stead. He would bring over Itachi, who had just entered the academy and was on track to graduate early. He also brought Sasuke, a very kind but competitive boy that was Naruto's age from the Uchiha clan. Sasuke liked these days because his dad would actually train him and Itachini would train with him as well. He was frustrated and motivated by the fact that he had never beaten Naruto. In fact, over the six months Naruto had started to lap him in progress. Although Fugaku knew that it wasn't fair to compare the boys due to Naruto's other trainers, it still brought a frown whenever he thought his boy was being outdone. On the other hand, Naruto had never beaten Itachi. In the beginning, Itachi had walked right over Naruto. He was better in every shinobi art, a true Uchiha. By the sixth month, Itachi would have to admit that the boy who was three years younger than him made him have to try. Itachi was being pushed in a spar, by a four-year-old Naruto. The boy was slightly slower than him, but Kami was he tricky to fight. His reflexes were top-notch, and his fighting instinct was incredible. In the last week of the sixth month, Itachi activated his Sharingan by sparring with Naruto. Despite Itachi only being eight, he was now the youngest Uchiha since Madara to activate his Sharingan. When Itachi returned to the clan compound that day and told his best friend Shursue about activating his Sharingan while fighting Naruto, Shursue insisted on coming to every Thursday training session after that. Jiraiya would stop by the compound for a week at a time, a couple times each year. After the night and subsequent morning with Tsunade, they worked things out. To Jiraiya's immense relief Tsunade said she would give them a test drive. Her conditions were there is absolutely no peaking in Kanoha and if he slept with any woman other than her, not only would it be over, but she threatened impotence. She requested that he abstain from it outside the village as well, but she knew that was a big ask. She just didn't want his perversion thrown in her face is all. Jiraiya always woke up with a shit-eating grin when he was in town, and this had a positive effect on Naruto's training. Jiraiya focused on Naruto's fuinjutsu. Being the only fuinjutsu master in Konoha meant that the responsibility to teach the last Uzumaki the art fell to him. Since the kid started his calligraphy when he was three, Jiraiya was always surprised by the progress Naruto made. Jiraiya couldn't help but get excited and talk through seals when Naruto displayed an almost innate understanding of the art. When he was four, Naruto created his own storage seal. He managed to improve on the basic storage seals found in the shinobi shops and increase their capacity by double. When Naruto was six, he created a variation of the explosive tag that Jiraiya instantly took to the Hokage for mass production. Naruto made a flash tag that would only flash a 180-degree angle from where it was deployed. 
the potency of the flash depended on how much chakra was put into the tag. Being a knucklehead, Jiraiya had asked Naruto to flash him on max power to see the tag's effects. Jiraiya couldn't see until Tsunade had gotten home from the hospital that night and fixed the poor pervert's eyes. Speaking of perverts, since Jiraiya had sworn off all things perverse, he needed a muse. He found that in Naruto. The boy would talk about his innocent friendships with Ino and Hinata and the pervert's mind automatically converted it into his raunchy novels. All he had to do was add in all things sexual, which came naturally to him, and Naruto's stories helped him find his inspiration. At the risk of Tsunade's wrath, Jiraiya gave Naruto a scroll on Sensual Ninjutsu, Level 1. This scroll taught Naruto how to use chakra in massages to stimulate other people relieve stress. As Naruto's chakra control got better, he began testing out the Sensual Ninjutsu. At first, he offered Tsunade, Tsubaki, Shizun, Ayam and the nurses from the hospital massages. He said it was to practice chakra control and make them feel better. Most of the women found it amusing until Naruto would give them a massage on their back, feet or hands. The immediate relief of tension and pain made Naruto a hero around the hospital. Stories of Naruto's success in the sensual arts gave Jiraiya even more inspiration and made him want to teach Naruto even more. Jiraiya poured his effort into his student son whenever he was in town and always left Naruto with the next level of Fuenjutsu book. At this rate, Jiraiya would be able to let Naruto into Minato's study in no time. These training sessions produced such good results that Fugaku and Hayashi couldn't help but share with the other clan heads. The hype around Uzumaki Naruto grew to a dim roar among those in the know. Sure, there are prodigies like Itachi, Shursue, and Kakashi. They were young and each of them displayed an amazing level of skill for their age. However, the positive energy that each teacher got from training Naruto made him unique among the prodigies. Not only did Naruto learn at an amazing rate, but he also made those teaching him enjoy doing so. These rave reviews caused Inoichi, Chuza, and Shikaku approach the Hokage about getting time to teach Naruto. For Tsum, it was the reviews on Naruto's massages that made her want to teach the boy. It seemed like a great deal to her. Teach the pup a bit and then he can take care of all the stress. To the Hokage's amusement, all requests to teach Naruto came in on the same day. He couldn't help but chuckle. This resulted in Naruto's playdates turning into impromptu training sessions with various clan heads and heirs. Naruto's free time the rest of the week were rest days for Naruto. Although Tsubaki still made him study on these days, it was his time to relax, recover, and be a child. Over the following three years, Tsunade frequently took him for play dates with his clan friends. She preferred to have the kids come to the Namikaze estate since Naruto was still young and they wanted to keep him out of the public eye, but relaxed that standard after a while. All clan leaders and family members had agreed to keep Naruto's existence a secret. Whenever he was in public, he was referred to as just Naruto. No clan name was ever said out loud, in case nosy ears were listening. This worked well because there was not a single attempt from the villagers, or outside Shinobi, to attack Naruto. So, after a while, Tsunade and Tsubaki began accompanying Naruto to the other clan's compounds or out to parks. He developed relationships with each of the clan children. Aside from the pre-made friendships between the Shikamaru, Ino and Chuji, Naruto was the link that bound the clan kids together. Naruto was the ringleader of the boys. He would always partake in the games, choose where they should go, kept the conversation fun and flowing. Not to mention that he even made the lazy Nara enjoy running around and playing. Kiba loved rough housing with Naruto and running around the woods in the Inazuka compound with him. Chuji loved the trips to the barbecue or ramen stand. Naruto even got Sasuke into his friend group. The timid Uchiha child struggled at first, but Naruto never left anyone out. In time, Sasuke began hanging out with the boys even without Naruto present. 
Shikamaru enjoyed just talking with Naruto while cloud gazing. He even taught Naruto how to play shogi, which often led to the boys sitting on the porch while huddled over the shogi board. Either Naruto was a Nara in disguise or he was a natural at shogi because he would come to the Nara compound, talk about anything and everything while playing shogi and then push Nara clan members hard. The boy was just so frustratingly random in his moves. Even Shikaku nearly lost to Naruto when Naruto was seven. The complete and total lunacy of Shikaku having to visibly concentrate, sweat and plan out his game made it seem like the Nara clan had lost, even though he won. Yoshino couldn't get enough of the blonde knucklehead. He brought such vibrant energy to the lazy compound that she often bribed Tsunade with sake nights just to get Naruto over. When Naruto was six, Shikaku made Shika spar with Naruto. Shika was beaten in ten seconds, which frustrated the lazy Nara. No matter how troublesome it was, nobody wanted to be beaten that soundly. So, Shikaku nearly fell out of his chair the next morning when Shikamaru asked him to train him. The sight of the Nara air running around the compound and sweating made the lazy clan feel one word, troublesome. Ino had the hardest time with Naruto. She liked hanging out with him so much. He was a fellow blonde, he was cute, he was funny, he was strong, and he always put his friends first. Ino loved that much about him. What was hard for Ino was that she wasn't allowed to talk about him or ask questions. She knew that everybody knew some big secret about Naruto, it was obvious from how the parents acted around him. It was why the secret was so important, it was why she couldn't ask. Questions, it was why Naruto seemed to be one big secret. When Ino turned five and Naruto came to her birthday party, she decided to ask him. She pulled Naruto into her room and then asked. Naruto, do you know why I am not allowed to talk about you to anyone else? I'm sorry Ino, I don't really know myself. I asked back on about it and she said it was to keep me safe and that she would tell me soon, a sheepish Naruto replied. Well, that sucks, do you know who your parents are? We only get to call you Naruto and we never use your last name. I know that my mom was an Uzumaki and that she died the night of the Kyubi attack. I don't know who my dad was, but he is part of that secret that Tsunade Bakon said she would tell me soon. Oh, okay. So, you are an Uzumaki, were they a clan? I haven't heard of them. Naruto's face fell and he replied, yeah, they were a clan. Supposedly they helped found Konoha, but they never really lived here. Then, in the second great ninja war their home was destroyed. Tsunade Bakon thinks that I may be the last Uzumaki. Ino felt terrible, she saw how much this hurt Naruto and she didn't want him to be sad. She even surprised herself when she leaned forward and gave Naruto a kiss on the cheek and said sorry for asking. A blushing Naruto reeled and asked Ino, what, what, what was that for? Ino giggled and replied with, it is because I like you silly and I don't want you to be sad. From that point forward, Ino was Naruto's champion in the gossip network. She kept an ear out to make sure nobody was talking about Naruto or spreading any information that shouldn't be out. Sure, she loved telling her friends how nice and cute he was, but she never betrayed Naruto's trust or told anybody his last name. She kept him on a pedestal in her heart as the truest standard of a friend. Meeting the fox Naruto loved his life. He was almost eight years old. Tsubaki had always been there for him, taught him and dare he say, loved him. Tsunade was another part of his family that Naruto couldn't live without. She kept him reeled in and bound to sanity. Naruto always found it amusing when Tsunade would pull him inside from a long day's training. She would throw him into the bathroom and not let him out until he was spotless. Her training was productive and made him feel in control of himself, which was quite a feat for an endless ball of energy. He has been meditating for almost four years now. This practice helped him process his training into easily manageable and digestible portions. It was during one such meditation session at the end of Naruto's training that Naruto went deeper than ever before. He was feeling his chakra and giving into its flow. 
he followed it from its origin, his heart, down and throughout his body. As he got caught in the flow, Naruto felt something pull on his conscious. As Naruto followed that pull and opened his eyes, his found himself in a hallway. One side of the hallway was illuminated in blue light. As he reached out and touched it, he immediately knew that it was his chakra. He could feel the flow. As he crossed the hallway, he paused in front of the red lighting. Once again, he knew it was chakra, but it felt different. As he reached his hand toward the red light, he felt the heat and immense energy it was emanating. When he touched the source of the red light, he felt anger and hate and something else. It felt wrong, like it was off balance. While this feeling scared him a bit, he decided to follow the hallway. He noticed as he walked by that the doors were labeled with names. Over one door read, Bakon. Out of curiosity he opened it and watched a memory of him and Tsunade learning water walking. That was only a couple months ago but it played out for him like a movie. He was in his orange swimsuit, completely soaked from head to toe. Tsunade was standing out on the lake laughing at him holding her favorite bottle of sake. Ah, come on back on. There is something you aren't telling me. I can't seem to get this right. Last time, I created a tidal wave and this time I take one step and then fall right in. It is something you have to figure out for yourself, brat. It is kind of like tree walking, that is the only clue that I will give you. Naruto pouted for a bit, then got a devious smirk on his face. Are you sure that's all you can tell me back on? If you help me get this done today, I will give you shoulder and foot massages every day this week. Tsunade couldn't help but be proud of this bugger, all right, brat. The thing is that water is not a solid like wood. Therefore, the chakra flow cannot stay fixed. You must fluctuate your chakra based on the depth and condition of the water. Try double what you did for your last attempt then just trying to stand on the water's surface before walking. Thanks, Bakon, said Naruto as he flashed his million watt smile at Tsunade. After another few attempts, Naruto found the right flow and was able to stand on the water. Naruto focused on pulling himself out of the memory and stood in front of the door. This was surreal, who knew he could meditate and review memories like this. As he marveled on this, he continued walking down the hallway. After a minute, he came upon a massive door, about forty feet high and twenty feet wide. It was emblazed with the crest of a nine-tailed fox on each door. Naruto felt drawn into the room, like there was something he needed to do in there. As he entered, he marveled as the room opened up into a massive auditorium-like room. However, Naruto noticed that he couldn't see all the way across. After a bit, the room faded into darkness. So, being a curious almost eight-year-old child, Naruto continued walking. As he approached the darkness, a massive cage came into view. Being this close, Naruto could not see the end of the cage. Since Naruto couldn't see anything behind the cage, Naruto called out. Hello, is there anybody there? After he spoke, a light appeared from above and illuminated the massive head of a fox. Its head was lying over its paws that were crossed under its snout. Naruto could feel the massive power radiating from the creature. Its beautiful fur produced a reddish-orange sheen that was, beautiful. The beast didn't move or do anything, so Naruto called out again. Hello, Mr. Fox. This got a response from the creature. It opened its massive eyes, and, in its eyes, Naruto saw the projection of what looked like a windmill shuriken. It had three black blades with a hole in the middle. Each of the blades curved off clockwise and connected to the next blade. Underneath the projection of this shuriken, Naruto could see a pair of slitted red eyes that looked out of focus. Naruto was stunned by the pattern, but he got the feeling that something wasn't right. It was then that Naruto heard one word before being ejected from that place, help. Naruto reeled and took a deep breath upon returning to the world. He couldn't believe what he just experienced. 
He knew that happened inside him, otherwise he wouldn't have been able to see his own memories. So, what was that fox? That was so vivid and real. It couldn't have been his imagination, could it? No. No way. It asked me for help. There is something inside me that needs help, thought Naruto. He got up and raced off to find Tsunade. Since the sun was setting, Naruto was sure that he would find Tsunade in the kitchen with Tsubaki. He would probably get scolded for missing dinner again. As he burst into the kitchen, Tsunade laughed at him. Out late training again, brat? Your dinner is in the fridge. Despite his hunger, Naruto needed to get this out. Not now, Bakon. I have something every important to ask you. Tsunade and Tsubaki noticed the serious and slightly panicked look on his face, okay, Naruto, what is it? Bakon, I was meditating and saw something. I need to know. Is there a fox in me? The color drained from Tsunade and Tsubaki. Seeing their reaction, Naruto knew the likely answer. For years of learning and training his mind led him to one conclusion, is it, is it the Kyubi? After a pregnant pause, Tsunade answered Naruto, yes, brat. There is a long story behind this, and it appears we will have to deal with it now. Get cleaned up and then we are going to the Hokage's office. An hour or so later, Tsunade, Tsubaki and Naruto walked into the Hokage's office. Hiruzen had dealt with most of the paperwork and was puffing on his pipe as they entered. He immediately noticed the serious looks on their faces and sat up. Good evening, Naruto-kun. What brings you to me so late in the day? Tsunade answered by asking Hiruzen to clean the room and asking if Jiraiya was in town. At the serious response, Sarutobi said that Jiraiya just got into town. He dispatched an ANBU to find him and bring him to the office. Fifteen minutes later and Jiraiya jumped in through Sarutobi's window and threw out a casual, what's up, sensei. He then looked around the room and saw the rest of its occupants. He walked up to Tsunade and gave her a chaste kiss while greeting Tsubaki and ruffling Naruto's hair. Tsunade returned the kiss and said, Jiraiyakin, serious mode please. This got an immediate response from the normally playful Toad Sanin. Sarutobi retook control of the conversation and said, Okay, Naruto-kun. Why don't you tell us what this is about? Thus, Naruto recounted his trip into his mind. What started as being impressed by being able to visit one's mindscape turned into a deathly silence and pallid looks on the faces of Jiraiya and the third Hokage. Okay, my boy. It appears that it is time to have this conversation, replied Hiruzen with palpable desire to avert this conversation. Thus, Hiruzen began recounting the night of the Kyubi attack with the conclusion of the Kyubi being sealed into Naruto. Naruto processed the information for a bit, then asked, Gigi, something didn't feel right with the fox. When I felt its chakra, it felt like something was interfering with it. Like when Shizunekin put me in a genjutsu. Then, when the fox opened its eyes, it looked like something was on its eyes. The pallid expression of Jiraiya and Hiruzen darkened, while Tsunade and Tsubaki didn't seem to know what was going on. It was Jiraiya that asked, Naruto, could you show us? Maybe draw it for us? Sure thing, Jiraiya sensei Naruto unsealed a brush and some paper from a storage seal on his shirt. He then drew out the pattern that he saw on the fox's eyes and the entire room was drowned in killing intent from the Hokage. In response to this, 4ANBU showed up kneeling. What do you need, Hokajesima? asked the dog-masked ANBU. Inu, bring me Fugaku and Shursue Uchiha, now. In response to this, the ANBU disappeared and reappeared twenty minutes later with a confused Shursue and Fugaku. The Hokage held up Naruto's drawing and asked, Do you too recognize this pattern? Although confused, and now slightly perturbed by the feeling in the room, they both nodded. Hiruzen then asked, Fugaku, this is the pattern of a Mangekyo Sharingan, will be called MS for short from here on out. Is that correct? 
Although he was hesitant to spill clan secrets, Fugaku caught the mood in the room and noted the present parties. Hi, Hokage-sama. May I ask what is going on? Hiruzen had Naruto retell his encounter with the fox and he put focus on how things felt off and the pattern on the fox's eyes. Both Fugaku and Shursue immediately went white. There had been suspicions about the fox being controlled, specifically by the Sharingan. Now, there is little doubt. So, there is either a traitor among the Uchiha or an unknown MS wielder controlled the fox. Fugaku, I never thought I would have to ask this, but I need a straight answer from you. Are you two the only MS wilders in the Uchiha clan currently? Hi, Hokajesima. As far as the clan is aware, that is correct. You understand the implications of this effect being on the QB still? Hi, Hokage-sama. The user is still alive and if the fox were free, it would still be under that user's control. At this point, the Hokage flared his chakra again calling the ANBU. Bring me Inoichi, it is an emergency. Once again, the ANBU disappeared and reappeared with an Inoichi in his nightwear. You called, Hokage-sama? Yes, Inoichi. There is a lot going on, but I trust Fugaku and Shursue will consent to you taking a look through their minds. I need to clear them of suspicion before we move forward. Fugaku and Shursue looked startled, but nodded their heads nonetheless and said, Hi, Hokage-sama. A very confused and hesitant Inoichi responded, Can I ask why, Hokage-sama? Hiruzen looked to Naruto, who once again recounted his visit to the fox's chambers. Inoichi was stunned speechless. He was only brought back by Hiruzen clearing his throat. Inoichi, make no mistake. I trust Fugaku and young Shursue there. I need only confirm what I believe before we can move forward. It will be done, Hokage-sama, replied Inoichi as he bowed and saluted. After an hour of mind-walking both Fugaku and Shursue, clearing them both of any liability, Inoichi recounted to the Hokage that they are trustworthy. Okay, Fugaku and Shursue, do either of you possess enough chakra to attempt and break the control on the Kyubi? Fugaku responded with, Hokage-sama, my MS does not have any mind control abilities. Mine are all combat-oriented. He then looked at Shursue. I believe I can do it, Hokage-sama. I want to help Naruto-kun. Hiruzen nodded and looked to Inoichi, can you take Shursue into Naruto-kun's mind and attempt to free the fox of this genjutsu? Inoichi paled, Hokage-sama, that is extremely risky. What if the demon awakes and attempts to hurt Naruto, Shursue, or myself? According to Naruto-kun, the fox said only one word, help. If we were to help it, not only would eliminate the control an unknown enemy has on the Kyubi, but it might be grateful and make things easier on Naruto-kun. Naruto stepped forward, Gigi, I don't know a lot about this, but I want to help it. It has been under someone else's control for almost eight years. If I were it, I would want somebody to help me. The room marveled at the confidence and righteousness of this boy. Most ninja would cower in front of the Kyubi, but this boy is standing up to his burden head on. Inoichi reluctantly conceded, Hi, Hokage-sama. Shursue also nodded. Inoichi continued, Okay, you two take a seat on the couch. Naruto when I connect Shursue to you, your mind it is going to feel heavy. I need you to focus on meditating and drawing us back to your mindscape. I will help guide you there. Shursue, just hold on to my chakra and enjoy the ride. Once we get there, it is all on you. Hi, Inoichi-sama. As Inoichi sat and touched Shursue's head, a moment later Naruto felt Inoichi's hand touch his head. He then felt their presences and dragged them along his chakra flow, down toward his stomach and into his seal. The three opened their eyes in the hallway that led to the Kyubi's auditorium. Inoichi marveled at the layout and precision of a child's mindscape. When he saw how the memories were divided by each person important to Naruto, he marveled at the boy's ability to organize his mind in this way. 
the group continued walking to the massive door. Before opening the door Naruto gave them a warning to prepare themselves. They both nodded and followed in after Naruto. The immediate pressure they felt from the Kyuubi's aura was immense. The density of its chakra, the might of its presence. Then there was this child, walking forward like it didn't bother him at all. Naruto approached the cage and called out once again. Kyuubi, I am here. You asked for help, I have brought it. The light above once again illuminated the head of the giant fox. It opened its eyes in response to the noise and looked out at Naruto, Chursue, and Inoichi. Inoichi took a step back and felt himself sweat. Shursue marveled at the fox and the pattern emblazoned upon its eyes. He took a deep breath, channeled his chakra to his eyes activated his Sharingan, which gradually transitioned into his MS. This got a response from the fox. Its head raised and it seemed to respond to the Sharingan. Shursue intoned, Kai, Koto Amitsukami, return to your own free will, Kyubi. The lights around the room shuddered. The Kyubi let out a mighty roar that instantly ejected Shursue and Inoichi from the mindscape. The Kyubi stood and shook out its fur, seemingly happy to be moving of its own volition for the first time in eight years. After settling back down and getting comfortable, the Kyubi looked at Naruto with its massive, red slitted eyes. He took in the boy in front of him and a growl emanated from deep in its throat. So, I finally meet my new jailer. Normally, I would eject you from my presence, but I am in your debt. Said the Kyubi in a deep tone that radiated with power. The young boy standing in front of the majestic fox stood stricken by the combination of power, grace and beauty. He took a while to process that the Kyubi was waiting for him to respond. It, it's nice to meet you, Kyubi-sama. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. A guttural chuckle escaped from the Kyubi, ah, so Kushina's brat is the one I am now stuck in. Well, boy, as I said, I am in your debt for freeing me from that man's cursed control. I do not leave debts unpaid, so speak. Uh, I, uh. I don't really want anything from you. I saw you when I was meditating and noticed something wasn't right. Then you asked me for help, so I brought help. And, uh, yeah. That's pretty much it. Why did you help me, Ninjen? Because I thought that I wouldn't want somebody controlling me and I felt its influence in your chakra. It was dark, nasty and nothing good could ever come from it. So, it seems you picked up my ability to sense negative emotions. Very good. Okay, Ninjen. As I said, I do not want to be in your debt, and I am tired from that accursed Jinjutsu. I will answer one more question, then I will sleep. Oh, okay, uh. Said an overwhelmed Naruto, then he took a deep breath and asked, Did you attack Kanoha because you wanted to or were you forced to attack Kanoha? Once again, a deep chuckle filled the auditorium. When I was ripped from your mother, I was angry. However, as I was reforming, that man put me under his control. After that, he gave me the command to destroy Kanoha. When I was given that order, I began attacking your village until that yellow-haired Ninjen and the Toad attacked me and moved me away from the village. We fought for a bit, but the Toad and your mother held me down while that cursed Yandame Hokage sealed me into you. Wow! So the Yandame did fight you, huh? And my mom? Thank you for telling me. Can I ask one more thing? The Kyubi nodded while looking at this child. Such a small Ninjen, but he is holding in his fear. What's more, I don't feel any hate or resentment coming from him, thought the Kyubi. Naruto continued, can you tell me about this man that controlled you? I want to tell my Hokage Gigi and Tsunade Bakan about him. Very well, Tiny Ninjen. The man wore a black cloak and an orange spiral mask. The mask had an eye hole on the right side ere his accursed Sharingan put me under his control. That is all for today, I wish to sleep. Give me some time and think about what you want from me. I do not wish to owe any favors. Thank you, Kyubi-sama. 
By the way, my name is Naruto Uzumaki, Databeo. As Naruto withdrew from the Kyuubi's auditorium and exited his mindscape, he heard that deep chuckle again. Very well, Naruto Uzumaki. As Naruto came back to the real world, he blinked open his eyes and saw every eye in the room trained on him. Tsunade was worrying over him like a mother hen. When she saw him come to, she crushed him into her breasts in a full-blown, backbreaking hug. Naruto, Naruto are you okay? The boy was exhausted, his eyes were threatening to close on him. He shook out his head and summoned just a bit more energy. Hi, hi I am fine. I just talked with the Kyuubi for a bit. He told me about the man that attacked that night and put him under his control. He also said that he owes me a favor for breaking that genjutsu and that I should think about what I want from him. Everyone was startled by this bit of information, but Jiraiya and Saratobi's eyes met briefly. They had their suspicions about that night, now they were confirmed. Naruto continued, the Kyuubi said that a man in a black cloak with an orange spiral mask took him out of my mother. The mask had one eye hole on the right-hand side and that all he could see was the Sharingan. Fugaku and Shursue exchanged a worried glance to each other then looked to the Hokage. Hiruzen locked eyes with each of them. This information is to stay in between the people. Of this room. The damage this could do to the Uchiha, and the village is unimaginable. Naruto, that is all for tonight. I will ask you to come back to my office later to review this conversation you had with the Kyuubi. For now, go home and rest. It is clear you need it. Tsubaki bowed to the Hokage and took Naruto and left the room. Fugaku, I trust you, Minato trusted you and Naruto trusts you. I need you to be discreet and investigate every clan member that was unaccounted for that night. Before you start, I am not saying with certainty that it was anyone still within the village that did this. However, we cannot leave any stone unturned. You are not to tell anybody of the real reason, but I need you to watch your own clan. Fugaku's face tightened. The Uchiha clan were a proud clan. It is painfully obvious the ramifications this could have on his clan. So, he swallowed his pride and the bit of betrayal he felt at suspecting his fellow clan members. Hi, Hokajesima. It will be done. Shursue bowed with Fugaku, showing his loyalty to the Hokage. Very well, that is all for tonight, you may return home. We will talk more later. He continued, Jiraiya, I don't even need to say it. Find this man in the orange mask. Work that spy network of yours. It is clear that this man poses the greatest threat to our village. And please, be discreet. We don't want him knowing that we know. Jiraiya replied with a deadly serious face, Hi, Sensei. I will set out soon, but it is time the Gaki knows. It is time we give him access to his inheritance and help prepare him. Please Sensei, tell him. He is ready. With those parting words, Jiraiya jumped out the window. The night drew to a close. So much time had passed that the sun was rising, and light began peeking into the Hokage's office. He sighed, this damn job is going to be the death of him. He shuffled some paperwork into a makeshift pillow and tried to catch a little bit of sleep before the day started right back up on him. The next afternoon, Naruto woke up from a restless night, or should he say mornings, sleep. His mind was in a whirlwind of activity. All of the revelations of that night came into a loose focus. First and foremost, he spoke to the Kyuubi. The same Kyuubi that attacked the village. The same Kyuubi that is said to be the most powerful demon beast. He wondered, what is a demon? The Kyuubi talked to him, and while it was scary, like shit your pants and pray you don't die scary, the Kyuubi told him about that night and about his, mother. He said he was ripped out of his mother, but then she held him down. So, the Kyuubi being forced out of his mother didn't kill his mom? Then what killed her? As one thought came into clarity, another thought assaulted it and forced it out of focus. Thus, when a disheveled Naruto scooted into the kitchen rubbing his eyes, 
both Tsunade and Tsubaki adopted concerned looks on their faces. Tsubaki opened the conversation, Did you get any sleep? Naruto? You still look quite tired. Hi, Tsubaki Kaken. I just have a lot on my mind, and I can't seem to settle it all down. The response enhanced Tsubaki's concern and she walked over to Naruto and embraced him in a motherly hug. It was the least she could do after this child brought so much light and life back into her world. He had brought her back from the brink of losing herself in grief after the Kyubi attack. Naruto seemed to melt into the hug as she whispered comfortable reassurances into his ear. Brat, I know you probably have a lot of questions, so why don't we answer some of your questions before we go back to the Hokage's office, asked Tsunade in a gentle tone. Okay, back on. Can you tell me about Kushina? Is, is she really my mother? A small smile lit upon Tsunade's face as she remembered the brash, raucous and eternally loyal Kunoichi. Your mother was an amazing woman, Naruto. She was so excited when she found out she was pregnant with you. She should have been the one here with you instead of me. I was supposed to be the one to deliver you, but I was, out of town at the time. Guilt racked Tsunade. She had been so caught in her own grief that she went on a bender in Tenzaku town and completely missed Naruto's birth. If she were there, maybe if she were there that whole night would have been different. Back on, I wish I knew my mother, but you and Tsubaki Kaken have always been here for me. You have helped me so much. I don't know why you look sad, but please, back on, don't ever say you shouldn't be here. I don't know what I would do without you. I love you. Tsunade Bakon. And with those three words and a hug from the tiny blonde, the dams broke. The pent-up grief and frustration flowed out of Tsunade and onto Naruto in the form of sparkling, purifying tears. After that, Tsunade spent the rest of the early afternoon sharing stories of Kushina with Naruto. The smiles and laughter emanating from the blonde lit up the house and seemed to clear out the remainder of Tsunade's grief. Okay, brat. It is time we went back to talk with the Hokage. Twenty minutes later, Naruto and Tsunade ambled into Hiruzen's office and saw Jiraiya leaning against the wall to the Hokage's left. Hiruzen made a quick hand sign, and four blurs could barely be seen leaving the room. Jiraiya then flashed through a quick series of hand signs and slammed his hand on the ground. A translucent blue light flowed into Kanji as it spread out in the four cardinal directions around the room. Okay, Naruto-kun. Last night you said the fox told you a couple things. Could you repeat them for this worn old man? I have already gotten Shirsue's and Inoichi's versions of the story, but they were ejected before you were able to talk to the Kyubi, said a clearly exhausted Hokage. Hi, Gigi. The Kyubi said that the man attacked and somehow forced the Kyubi out of my mom, Kushina Uzumaki. He then said the man put him under some super strong genjutsu and ordered him to attack the village. He also said that the fourth Hokage sealed him into me while some giant toad and Kachan held him down. Then he said he owes me one favor for freeing him from the genjutsu, but I don't really know what to ask him for, replied a vibrant and refreshed Naruto. His earlier conversation with Tsunade helped slow his thoughts down enough. Very good, Naruto-kun. Let's take this one at a time. What the fox says matches with what we found that night in the cave after the Kyubi's attack. The ANBU and nursing staff were killed with kunai. So, it is safe to assume the man in the orange mask killed them as well. Hiruzen gritted out that last part through clenched teeth. Naruto-kun doesn't need to be weighed down by an old man's grief, thought Hiruzen. I am sorry I wasn't there Buwako-chan. Now, Naruto-kun, can you tell me about how the Kyubi acted? Did it seem like we can trust him? Well, Gigi, I think we can trust him. When I was in there, he said something about my ability to sense negative emotions coming from him. Tsunade cut in, wait, Naruto, since when can you sense negative emotions? Her incredulous tone amused Naruto. Naruto chuckled and sheepishly rubbed at the back of his head, um, I guess I have always been able to feel it a little bit. 
But when I touched the fox's chakra and felt the dark disturbance the Jinjutsu caused, well then it became clearer. And then when the Kyubi said that, well it all kind of made sense, I guess. That is interesting indeed, Naruto-kun. Mito Uzumaki used to have an ability like that. It wasn't very well documented, but it may have come from the Kyubi as well, the third Hokage chimed in with a little more energy in his voice. Wait, the Mito, like Hashira Majiji's wife? She had the QB too, asked an interested Naruto. Very good, Naruto-kun. Your lessons with Tsubaki and Hitomi are clearly paying off. Yes, Mito Senju Uzumaki was the wife of the first Hokage and the first Jinchuriki of the QB. Jinchuri what? Jinchuri? Questioned a confused Naruto. Jinchuriki, Naruto-kun. Those who seal the biju into themselves are referred to as Jinchuriki. You are the third Jinchuriki to the Kyubino Kitsune. The same as your mother and Mito. Wow, okay, GG. Well, are there other Jinchuriki? Yes, Naruto-kun. There is a total of nine biju, each with a different number of tails. These biju are sealed into humans and the humans are called Jinchuriki meaning, the power of human sacrifice answered the Hokage in his professor tone. That's awesome. Can I meet them, Gigi? I want to know what the other biju and Jinchuriki are like, replied Naruto in a tone of childlike awe and exuberance. Hiruzen chuckled, well Naruto-kun, biju and their Jinchuriki are closely guarded secrets of the various nations. The power that each Jinchuriki represents holds the balance of power throughout the elemental nations. Therefore, it is not common for the Jinchuriki to meet, unless it is on the fields of battle. That is one of the reasons we have kept you so hidden, Naruto-kun. Because I wanted to give you the chance to grow before you were known to the public. Okay, GG. I understand but you said one of the reasons, what is the other reason? Hiruzen sighed and took a deep drag on his pipe. Jiraiya and Tsunade stepped forward and put a hand on each of Naruto's shoulders. Naruto-kun, I am going to tell you a big secret because I believe I can trust you. Until we all decide that people should know, you need to keep this a secret. As of right now, only a few of the clan heads know who your father is, and it needs to stay that way. My, father. Are you finally going to tell me who he was? Naruto's tone cracked and damn near broke every heart in the room. We sure are, Gaki. We all trust you can handle this, so please stay calm and listen to the Hokage. Jiraiya said with a big smile plastered on his face. Tsunade just gave his shoulder a little squeeze. Hiruzen continued, Okay, Naruto-kun. You already know your mother was Kushina Uzumaki. What you may not know about her is that she was the Whirlpool Princess. In her home nation of Yuzushiagakor, she was to daughter of the last Kage before its downfall. And your father was Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage. Hiruzen let that hang as he observed the boy. His eyes were wide and shining with a layer of Yetofall tears. His mouth was hanging open as he slowly turned his head and looked at the portrait of his now known father. The man had big azure blue eyes and the same shade of sun-kissed blonde hair that he did. He had two bangs framing his face and wore a jonin flak jacket with a white haori laid over it. The confidence and power he exuded could be felt from his portrait alone. As Naruto was lost looking into the portrait of the fourth, Hiruzen walked over to said portrait. He opened the picture that was set on some hinges to reveal a seal that was kept behind the picture. Hiruzen channeled some chakra into the seal and two scrolls popped out. He handed the scrolls to Naruto and said, Your parents made these letters in case something bad happened to them. In the ninja world, letters like these are needed to make sure loved ones get closure. Your parents gave these to me the night before you were born, Naruto-kun. Naruto hesitantly accepted the letters. With tears in his eyes, he opened the scroll that had a red hemming around its edges. Naruto looked down at the scroll through tear-filled eyes and read, to Naruto-kun from Kushina Uzumaki Namikaze. Anata, Naruto-kun, 
if you are reading this, it means something happened to me. I am writing this the night before I give birth to you. I cannot put into words how excited I am to meet you. For these past nine months, you grew in me and my love for you grew every single day. Your father is a great man, if something happens to me then you can trust in him. Minato-kun has been heckling me every day to listen to Tsunade and he is constantly nagging me about my health. Your father has loved you since the day I told him. Oh, Naruto-kun, I hope I get to tear this letter up. I hope you never have to feel this pain. My heart is shattering just thinking of you living without your kakan. Naruto, if the worst does happen there are a few things you need to know. I left the whole Konoha version of the Uzumaki clan scrolls in your father's study. The scroll is secured behind an Uzumaki blood barrier, and it is the one that is red. Use it wisely, use it to grow strong to protect yourself and those important to you. Second, Yuza Shiagakor fell twelve years before your birth. I never got the chance to go back there. If you can make it there, please secure our heritage. In the small home on the northwest outskirts of the village there is a seal array. This array will lead a true Uzumaki to where they need to go. Please do not let the centuries of knowledge our clan gathered die. If your Kachan can ask one more thing, please work to rebuild the Uzumaki clan and restore it to its former glory. Set up a home for them in Kanoha, spread the Uzumaki beacon far and wide and gather the remainders of our clan to Kanoha. Nothing is more precious to an Uzumaki than family. Ask Hiruzen, Tsunade, and Jiraiya to help you with this as a final favor to me. Naruto, this part is something my mother told me before I left Yuzushigakor, don't be picky. Eat lots and grow strong. Make sure that you bathe every day and stay warm. Also, don't stay up late. You need lots of sleep. And make friends. You don't need a lot of friends. Just a few. Ones you can really, really trust. I wasn't very good at it, but keep up with your studies and practice your ninjutsu hard. Remember that everyone has strengths and weaknesses. So don't get too depressed if you can't do something well. Respect your teachers and upperclassmen at the academy. Oh, and this is important. It's about the three prohibitions for a shinobi. 1. Be extra careful about lending and borrowing money. Put your mission wages into your savings account. No alcohol until you're 20. Too much can ruin your health, so drink in moderation. 3. Another prohibition is women. I'm a woman, so I don't know too much about this but. All you need to remember is that this world is made up of men and women. So, it's only natural to take an interest in girls but just don't get hooked on bad women. Find someone just like me. My boy, I pray to Kami that you will never read this letter, but if you do remember one thing. Your Kachan loves you dearly and I will be watching over you from the pure world. With all my heart and love Kushina Uzumaki Namikaze, Jiraiya, Tsunade, and Hiruzen remained silent while they watched this young boy read the scroll from his mother. The tears of sorrow that flowed freely seemed to sparkle as they turned into tears of happiness and then a look of determination and firm resolve fixed itself to Naruto's face. The young and rounded face of Naruto remained hardened as he picked up Minato's scroll and then, after taking a deep breath, Naruto opened the black scroll with yellow edges. To my son, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze from Minato Namikaze Uzumaki, my son, if you are reading this then it is likely that I have perished. I knew that becoming the Hokage meant that I would have to place the village before my life. I have no regrets. I met a beautiful and fiery red-headed woman that restored the light to my world, and it was your mother that kept my will of fire burning brightly. As Hokage, I will be forced to make decisions that you may not understand. If this is the case, know that I am sorry my son. When I took the mantle of Hokage, the whole village became my family and I will protect family with my life, no hesitation and no regrets. I swear to you that I did my best to lead Kanoha down the righteous path. If I perish before you have matured, please remember that I love you, eternally. 
I believe in you, my son. My goal right now is to grow a family with your mother and lead the ninja world toward the path of peace. It is likely I have not yet succeeded if you are reading this letter. I ask you to carry that mantle my son. I have only spoken to you and held you through your mother's belly, but I felt the light in you. I felt the power that can change the world. Do not fear making mistakes. Struggle forward, one foot at a time. Never give up. Never give up on never giving up. Protect those important to you. If Kanoha is your home, protect it in my stead. I am sorry for asking you to shoulder this burden, but I know that you can. You are my son, after all. Not to mention the fire you will inherit from your mother. On to the good stuff. My study is hidden behind a genjutsu seal that is on the wall to the left as you walk down the basement stairs. Please do not allow anybody except for Jiraiya down there. If you do so before deactivating the security seals, it is likely they will die. I ask you to guard that library diligently and please do not let outsiders gain access to our clan's knowledge. I have no doubt they will pressure you for it. Once again, I trust you to make the right decision with this. Use prudence my son and use what I have left you to accomplish your goals. I will love you, always and forever. Minato Namike Zuzumaki, after this letter, Naruto looks down through half-lidded eyes as sees some extra hastily written sentences. Naruto, the QB is attacking Konoha right now. I took the time to write this because I want you to know why I chose you to seal the beast. You are an Uzumaki, which means you will have enhanced vitality and a denser chakra that can handle the strain the QB will place on your body. Furthermore, I cannot ask anyone to do something that I am not willing to do myself. I am sorry to burden you with this. I only pray that Kanoha will honor you as the hero you are. In case they do not, let me be clear. You are the vessel of the QB, not the QB itself. A man in an orange mask, with a single Sharingan eye on the right side attacked us right after your birth. While I saved you, he ripped the QB out of your mother. For what it is worth, the QB is under a genjutsu, so if you talk to the beast, know that this attack was not purely its fault. I made the seal to slowly incorporate the QB's chakra into your chakra pool. The seal will purify the QB's chakra for you. This is a great power, my son, learn to use it wisely. With love forever, Minato. Naruto took a couple minutes to compose himself. His breathing was erratic and once again he felt the whirlwind of information storming through his mind. Tsunade embraced him from behind and Jiraiya squatted down in front of him to get on eye level. Naruto, we wanted to tell you, but I am sure you will come to understand how serious this information is. We are here for you. We will help you. When you are ready, you can let us know. With a ruffle of Naruto's hair and a squeeze to his shoulder Jiraiya stood up and backed away. Once Naruto had calmed his breathing, he started the conversation. Gigi, there is a lot in here. I need to go to my dad's study. He told me where it was and how to get in. The only one allowed to come with me is Jiraiya Kyofu. He is the only one keyed into the security seals. After a breath and with deadly seriousness Naruto continued, my father added to his letter the night of the QB attack. He informed me that the man in the orange mask with the Sharingan was the one who attacked. Hiruzen sat up straight and looked at Jiraiya, my previous orders on this stand. Find him. We need to stop him before he makes another attempt on Kanoha. Tsunade walked to Jiraiya and embraced him. During their embrace, she whispered, be safe, Baka. And come back to me. This moment of intimacy brought out the long-repressed pervert in Jiraiya. As both of Jiraiya's hands wrapped firmly around the ample posterior of Tsunade, Tsunade used her super strength to push him back and through the Hokage's office wall. The loud crash brought the attention of the ANBU, which made Hiruzen sigh and wave them off once again. Okay, Naruto-kun. Why don't you return home and start searching through your father's study? Remember, my boy, 
if you make any contact with the fox or need my help I am always here. Hi, Gigi. Thank you, Hokage-sama, for trusting me. I will guard this information and never betray your trust. As Naruto said this, he bowed deeply to his Gigi and Hokage. After recovering himself, Naruto took Tsunade's hand and returned to the Namikaze estate to begin sorting through his father's study. One week later in the Namikaze estate Naruto had been searching through his father's study for the past week. Naruto had Jiraiya ki Tsunade and Tsubaki into the security system so that they could enter with him. The number of scrolls and books on all matter of shinobi subjects was overwhelming. Sadly, it appears that neither of his parents were very organized. Naruto kept his usual training cycle with Tsunade, Danzo, the Hyuga, and the Uchiha. Sadly, Naruto was told that Itachi wouldn't be joining them for a while because his is going through his ANBU training. Fugaku was swollen with pride when he mentioned the nearly 12-year-old Uchiha joining the ANBU ranks. After training, the first four days and nights in the study were spent tidying up his father's library. His father was a genius, no doubt. However, it was clear to Naruto that his father embraced the mantra that genius functions best amongst chaos. His father's shaped oak desk was covered in dozens of scrolls. Each scroll was covered in a layer of dust and Naruto found that, after organizing, he would need to air out the room. On the fifth day, which was a Friday, so he didn't have any training, Naruto found the barrier that his mother had mentioned. After cutting his thumb with a three-pronged kunai that was on the desk, Naruto smeared some blood over the seal array. He marveled as the array spread, flashed and then the barrier shimmered into and out of existence. With the barrier down Naruto saw an ornate chest made of maple wood and covered in seals. Where the keyhole would normally be, the kanji seemed to coalesce into a seal array with the kanji for blood in the center. Naruto nicked his thumb again and the chest opened with a click and a hiss. Inside the chest were two scrolls, each the size of Naruto. One was an ornate scroll bound in a red leather with golden edging. The Azmaki clan symbol acted as a clasp for the scroll, which wouldn't budge when Naruto tried to open it. Following the pattern, Naruto nicked his thumb for the third time and smeared blood on the Uzumaki clan crest. The blood seemed to be absorbed by the crest and the scroll opened. The scroll was four feet wide and about twelve feet long when fully opened. Naruto laid it out on the floor and scanned the whole scroll. Near the bottom, the last entry was written in his mother's handwriting. For the love of Kami, if anyone is reading this and you are an Uzumaki, then use the Shadow Clone Jutsu. Otherwise, you will never finish. See seal below for Jutsu. Naruto let out a full, hearty laugh at his mother's antics. He saw a small seal below his mother's entry and fed some chakra into the seal. With a small poof of smoke, a scroll appeared. It was labeled, Kinjutsu Shadow Clone Jutsu. Naruto decided to heed his mother's advice and read through the scroll. The Shadow Clone Jutsu is an Uzumaki clan technique developed by Arashir Uzumaki. The technique is used by gathering chakra at the central chakra point, the heart, and the forming it through the ram, snake, tiger, hand signs then add the Uzumaki cross, you cross your right hand over your left. Each hand will have the pointer and middle fingers fully extended. The index and pinky fingers will circle back toward the thumb and the thumb will link with the index finger. See diagram if you are a visual learner. As you mold your chakra out of the central chakra point and through your fingers, focus on dividing your consciousness. This technique will divide your mind and chakra evenly among the clones you create. When the clone is dispelled, the consciousness of the clone and any unused chakra return to the user of this jutsu. This means that all matters of the mind, including the experience, knowledge and muscle memory the clone acquired, will return to the user. Warning, this Uzumaki Kinjutsu is highly dangerous. Do not make more clones than you can handle. Each clone cost about one rank jutsu worth of chakra. Start with a single clone and slowly build up before attempting to use, en masse. 
Along with the memories, the clones will return all mental fatigue incurred throughout their existence. If overused, this can cause unconsciousness, brain hemorrhaging and ultimately death. Naruto gulped nervously, then he thought, well everyone says that I have a ton of chakra and I heal super quick, so I guess it should be okay. With that thought, Naruto went to the small training area incorporated into his father's study. He began attempting the jutsu after practicing the hand sign repetition. It was difficult, how exactly does one focus on splitting one's mind? After about two hours of trying, Naruto was breathing heavily and cursing himself. He decided to sit down and meditate to calm his mind and his chakra. After five minutes of breath control, Naruto hopped back on his feet and screamed, Naruto Uzumaki never gives up. Databeo. Tsubaki heard Naruto scream and grew curious. She walked down the stairs into Minato's study. What she saw made her freeze. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, she watched as two Naruto's high-fived which made a resounding slapping sound. Her confusion turned to laughter as both Naruto's were shaking out their hands. Neither of them was expecting the force the other put into it. Naruto turned to Tsubaki as he heard her laughter. I did it, Tsubaki Kaken, screamed two elated Naruto's. Not knowing which one to look at Tsubaki addressed both of them and said, that's great, Naruto-kun. Mind telling me what you have done? She paled when she heard him say the shadow clone jutsu. She knew that this was a jonin level technique. And where, pray tell, did you learn such a technique? That technique is much too difficult for someone your age. I learned it in mom's scroll. Don't worry Tsubaki Kaken, I got this. I read all of the warnings. Warnings? Tsubaki asked as she grabbed the scroll that was near the edge of the training room. She paled when she read the list of potential side effects. Naruto-kun, you should not be doing this jutsu. You could get severely hurt. Don't worry, Tsubaki Kaken. Everyone says I have tons of chakra and heal super fast. Even after making this clone, I don't feel tired at all. Hey, Tsubaki Bakon, will you take this clone far away, tell it a secret and then punch it hard for me? Um, why would I do that, Naruto-kun? That seems kind of dangerous and mean. Ah, come on Kaken. It is just a clone and I need to test something out. At this, the clone adopted a nervous look on its face and nodded at Tsubaki. Okay, fine Naruto-kun. Come on you. She giggled as she walked around the corner. She then told the clone her secret and then bonked it hard on the head which transformed the Naruto into a puff of smoke. She walked back into the training room and looked amused as she took in Naruto. The boy was rubbing the top of his head and had a faraway look in his eyes for a second. The depth of the brilliant, azure blue eyes returned, and Naruto beamed at her, it worked, Kaken. It really worked. You told me you love running your hands through my hair when I sleep. Oh, and I owe you a foot massage for doing this favor, oh, okay, I guess. Tsubaki just shook her head in an amused fashion as she walked back up the stairs, Dinner is in one hour young man, do not be late. One hour later, Naruto walked into the kitchen doorway. Tsunade looked up and greeted him before returning to her medical report. Haya, Bakon, cried out Naruto as he took his seat next to Tsunade. She nodded, showing that she had heard him. Good evening, Bakon, said another Naruto as it sat down on the other side of Tsunade. Once again, with her attention focused on the report she muttered, Haya, brat. A third Naruto walked through the door, up to Tsunade and gave her a kiss on the cheek, let's eat, Bakon, I am famished. This roused Tsunade from her report, and she looked up incredulously. Incredulity turned to shock as two of the Naruto's popped out of existence. Naruto guffawed at the look on Tsunade's face. I got you good, Bakon, exclaimed Naruto with mirth in his voice as he fell out of his chair and started rolling on the floor while clutching his stomach. Tsunade couldn't believe it. She couldn't believe it at all. 
This brat, at roughly eight years old, just casually used two cage bunchen to pull a prank on her. Naruto, how, when, were those cage bunchen? Naruto started recovering from his laughter as he stood up, looked at her and just said, yup, found my mom's scroll. The last entry from her said that anyone reading the scroll should first learn the Kage Bunshin or otherwise learning everything would take too long. And before you say anything, Bakon, I know the risks. I started practicing it three hours ago and I can already make two clones. Incredulity returned to Tsunade's face, brat, you're telling me you learned the shadow clone technique, a jonin level jutsu, in under three hours? After a proud, yup, from Naruto Tsunade just shook her head and smirked. Well, brat, I guess this means I can train you about oh, say, three times harder on Monday. Naruto's giggling and laughter ceased, and his face paled a bit. Then he shook himself out of it and said, bring it on, back on. You. Better give up on trying to make me give up. Data Bayo. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.